Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God for his wonderful goodness towards us. We just thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. Praise his wonderful name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Greetings and salutation again to my dear brothers and sisters. Amen. Who are there with us, ready and waiting to join. And we give God thanks. Greetings again and good night, Sister Clark. As usual, first to sign in practically every week. Amen. So you have gotten that you have won that award. Praise God. Hallelujah. So as usual we wait a few moments until we have a few like about 10 and then we could do the prayer and then start glory to God hallelujah blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be the name of the Lord praise God amen 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 I don't mind waiting I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting for the Lord. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. Praise God. We are up to about six of us. Welcome, Sister Verona Griffiths. I think she's from Windsor Heights. If that's the same name, welcome, my dear sister, for joining with us at this time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Don't mind waiting. Welcome. Sister Tanisha Gale, thank you very much. Greetings to you and family as well. Hallelujah. God is wonderful. So we we are what, two minutes, three minutes almost into our being live. So we're going to go a little further than the prayers and then get started. Praise God. I don't know if you have rain where you are. Greetings, Officer Russell. But the rain is not pouring on my side at the moment, but it's nevertheless falling, but it's not heavy for heavily. Amen. And the others who are not in the island, but elsewhere, USA and others from the YouTube channel who are joining with us. We encourage you to continue to share the link and those who have not yet subscribed to do so and click the bell icon that every time you every time we are on you will be notified immediately so even if you don't get a link when you press the bell icon even if you don't get a link once you go on youtube and look notification will show you that we are live so even if the link delay once we go on notification show you that we are on and you can just click and come on same time bless your sister terry amen praise god yes so we can go ahead with the prayer now and then we can start our session we are getting into some real nitty-gritty of some issues and because of where we are at when persons miss are just come in the broadcast pathway sometimes they, they miss out on the, the foundational studies so we are looking at marriage divorce and remarriage amen let the bible speaks but we are doing matthew 5 we are 28 to 32 and we reached there last sunday night and we are going to 
go right back to verse 32 where we left off and i'm going to be doing a few things so let us just whisper a word a whisper a word of prayer father we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have afforded us to be here lord we thank you amidst all the negativities lord in the weather lord in the crime the covid conditions curfew hours we still give you thanks we still give you praise and with all that satan is doing against families against marriages against the church we are still the church of the living god god as we gather in our homes lord or even where we work at this time we ask that you will be with us we ask that your holy spirit will enlighten us show us deeper clearer and the things that are necessary that we can continue to worship god in spirit and in truth bless our session together lord let self be slain let teaching be easy and let your holy spirit lord remove the blinders from our hearts from our minds that we can see and understand the scriptures in Jesus' holy name we pray amen and amen so we give the lord thanks we give the lord praise so i'm going to do what i always do do a little a little review and then i want you to list i have a number of bible scholars well known well respected bible scholars and we are going to do some excerpts one and two excerpts as we go along and i'm giving pers uh, giving some more personal look at time to come on that when i start to teach a certain thing they won't miss it because if you miss it you may you may misunderstand the verses so matthew chapter 5 is where we are and it is from verse 27 to 32 so i'm just going to go back over as a brief recap and see where that takes us so there it is matthew chapter 5 verse 27 it says you have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery but i say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart and if thy right high offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and that thy whole body should be cast into hell and if thy right hand offend thee cut it off and cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one member should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell so we are going to recap this and as we recap this then we are going to move to 31 and 32 where we ended so when we look at the text i reminded you that christ is teaching on the, on the sermon on the mount he's talking to his disciples he opened up with blessed are they that this that 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 we call it beatitudes then he began to go into some more lifestyle life transforming teaching as it relates to how people live he goes on and he says you have heard and we explain in previous broadcasts about divorce and some other stuff so in verse 28 but i say unto you that whosoever look at on a woman and we explain that in context this is applicable to any man but in particular it's talking about a married man and this married man he keeps looking lustfully at another woman the other woman could have been another married woman a married woman or as well as a single woman amen and th and when you look at it carefully it may very well be a married woman but let us keep it mainly for the single one so he keeps looking he keeps looking daily and a one time him see her him see her over and over in a jamaica term he said he might pre the woman and you and i know that when people look at you or maybe lusting after you 
as a man or a woman, most times you are not aware, neither do you know it is happening. And I say it again, because some men are of the view that women are lusted after only when they dress in a way that isn't biblical. That's not right. There's no Bible verse for that. You could dress the best way you can as a Christian. You could dress the best way you know how as a Christian and men still lost after you. In other words, if you if you are if you if you're covered like the Muslim woman and it's only your eyes are sure, men will still lose. And if you are naked like strippers, men will still lose. So you're dressing by itself, irrespective of it's wrong or right, good or bad, does not give a man the right to loss after you. And it doesn't give the man the right to say the reason why he's lost in it because you're, you're just a particular way. That is not in the scripture. So when you look at this here, so the Bible said, the, the translation, King James, and others to NIV and a lot of them, they said, commit adultery with her. So we're asking the question, how can a man looking at a woman? The woman is not aware. The woman is not taking part in his loss. Yet still, you are saying that she, he, is, he, he, he commits adultery with her. Because whenever adultery is committed, technically speaking, we are going to ask, who commit the adultery? And with whom is the adultery committed? But Christ is teaching us now that apart from the Old Testament teaching, that a man would not be charged for adultery unless he physically sleep with a woman. Jesus is saying, Adultery begins in the heart. So watch it now. He said, For if the right eye offend thee, right eye. In other words, I see the man see the woman. And the thought that he can get her enter his mind. And he said, If your right eye offend you, pluck it out. He's not literally telling you to dig out your eye, but he's saying, Since your eye is what is leading you into sin, Put it on the wrap. Then he said, if your right hand. So after you see the woman, you got to approach her right hand and conduct business or, or, or pull her your way. That's what it is saying. That's what Jesus is addressing right here. And he said, better you go heaven with one eye or go heaven with one hand than to have your entire body intact and go to hell. That's what he's, he's doing right here. So let's, let's continue. And go to 30. Go to 31 and 2. Where we left off. Okay. And I have. I said I have excerpt to play. And then we come back to some stuff. Watch it now. He said. It had been said. Whosoever shall put away his wife. Apollosai. His wife. Let him give her. A right in divorcement. Apostasian. So. Deuteronomy 24. Is where the. Description is given, the instruction is given. The man who has no reason to divorce his wife, he can't prove that she committed adultery, yet he insists that he wants to divorce her. It says, Give her a certificate of divorce, put it in her hand, send her out of your house. Those are the two things. Give her a certificate in her hand. Send her out. And when she goes out, she is free to remarry to any man who so desire. Only thing is that if the second husband divorces her, she can come back to the ex-husband. And if the second husband die, she still can go back to the first husband. Because God said it would be an abomination. But whosoever shall put away. What about now? But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, Saving for the cause of fornication, cause it her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. This is where we ended the last session. So watch this now. There is something here which is called the exception clause. Cause it saving for the cause of. Another translation. Let me let me let me bring up 
Let me bring up Matthew 5. Let me bring up Matthew 5 for you. Matthew 5, 31 and 32 to, to, to explain something to you quickly. Yes. Matthew 5. Amen. Let me just show you that. Bible Hub. Okay. Let me go down to 31. No, verse 32. We are at verse 32. So, I'm running down to verse 32. So, if you don't have the Bible in your hand, you can look at the screen and this, the Bible is there. So, five versions are there. NIV, King James, and so on are there. So, watch this. The, the King James, alright, so the King James is column 4. NIV is column 1. So, King James says, saving for the cause of fornication. NIV says, except for sexual immorality. So there's a way called exception clause. American standard, except on the ground of sexual immorality. So if you watch my cursor, you'll understand what I'm saying. The other translation, which is New American Standard, says, except for the reason of unchastity. And the Allman Christian Standard Bible says, except in the case of. In other words, if you divorce her, and your reason for doing so is not sexual immorality and you're going to marry again. It's adultery. That's what Jesus is saying right here. That's what he's saying right here. So, what's the, what's the issue now? But the next part of the verse says, cause it her, which is the problem, cause it her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commit adultery. So, this is where we ended this, this stuff. So, I'm going to pick up back something. But I want to show you a clip. I want to show you a very important clip that deals with this section of Matthew chapter 5. A very well-known teacher. He explained some of the things I'm going to be talking about. I said, wow, when I found the clip, it is very short. And it is very important that we grasp what is shared so i'm bringing it up that we can look at it and learn a few things from him all right does the bible allow divorce in the case of well, adultery this even if the adulterer is hold on, hold broken on. and repentant and seeking reconciliation i know you are hearing but hold a second i don't think so hold a second i don't think the bible allows amen hold a second i know you're hearing Reverend Piper. So, notice I said to you, Jesus gave exception. But listen to this noted man of God on the issue. And then we will pick it up. Alright. So, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Alright. This gentleman is John Piper. Is a very, very well known and respected Bible teacher. Okay? Let me start. Let me get him started from scratch for you. Divorce. All right. Yes. Coming up. A moment, I see it, I see it buffing a little, so hold a second. Hold a second. All right. He's right there, so glory to God. Glory be to God. Okay, I can still pause. All right, go ahead. All right. Praise him. All right, so let me let me continue as I, the point I'm making. So 
he sees clearly some things here and then he takes a different position even though it is right there so let me see what's happening right here glory to god all right for those who don't know him reverend pipe john piper is a very noted writer and speaker i think he's now in retirement but he is still well known across the world here it comes i believe all right let us go now does the bible allow divorce in the case all right let's adultery, let's go is even if the is adulterer is broken and re repentant and seeking reconciliation <coughs> I don't think so. I don't think the Bible allows divorce and remarriage ever while the spouse is living. That's my radical, crazy, conservative narrow, hard-nosed, very needed view in our divorce happy culture um, does, does the Bible allow divorce in the case of adultery even Yes, I realize. Moving a little slow. Wow. All right. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Praise God. So let me just pick up the discussion. God, based on what I'm seeing, it should be playing smoothly. But these things do happen in the rainy season. But if you can hear me, I hear me well. We continue. Amen. So. Even if the adventure right. is broken. Now, I suppose. He's back on. Behind this question is. Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19.9. Those are the two exception clauses in the New Testament. Uh, if a man divorces a woman except for, the Greek word is pornia, if a man divorces a woman except for pornia uh, and marries another, he makes her commit adultery. So the question, this person I assume is taking the except clause it's sometimes translated except for unchastity, except for immorality. Uh, pornaya means most naturally fornication, which is why I have this bizarre interpretation that very few people follow, that it relates to fornication, that is sex prior to marriage. In other words, Jesus is not saying when he forbids divorce and remarriage that a sexual sin before marriage should keep you from marrying. And he did that because Joseph and Mary were in that situation in Matthew, and that's where these exception clauses occur. At least Joseph thought she was in that situation. So he's going to put her away and not marry her because he was a just man and didn't want to... Um, Mary and Jesus is saying, I don't, I don't have that situation in mind when I forbid divorce. So I don't think there is an exception for adultery in the New Testament, which means that especially 
if the adulterer were repentant, which is what this question is saying. Does the Bible allow divorce in the case of adultery even if the adulterer is broken and repentant? And I suppose my main argument here, just, just leave aside all the disagreement with what I just said because most everybody disagrees with me on those. Go to Ephesians 5. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to stop this one here because he goes on to to deal with some other things that are not specifically related to the exact question at hand. So I stop it right there. All right. Notice that when you look at the scripture, he says there are two exception clause in the New Testament, Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. Yet still, is not going with the exception okay and he made something some observation so saving for the cause of fornication and he tried to explain it a certain way and he he doesn't necessarily say that's how it is but i want to break it down for you because other people believe it so what they are saying is that when a man and a woman engage in the bible time the betrothal is considered married. So if while you are betrothed, like Joseph and Mary, if your wife goes and sleeps with another man, you can divorce her because of that. So in that case, it is called fornication. But there is no biblical precedence nor context to support that because once you are betrothed, you are considered wife and not Amen. Just a regular woman. So fornication wouldn't apply the way we use it in our time. All right. So John says something else which I want to see if I can I can give to you. Now that it is playing a little better. I'm gonna bring up something else that he does. Because you 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 if you hear Gina Jennings, I'm gonna bring Gina Jennings in at, at a certain time, but not tonight. They are different they are different times. So Whenever I'm dealing with the text that Gina Jennings is explaining, I will be bringing him right there for him to explain it for you. And then I will deal with it. So Gina Jennings, if, if not if no play upon film thing, but I'm going to show you something else. So listen to this gentleman here now. This gentleman here is called Monte Judah. And Monte Judah is a messianic Jew. All right? And he's explaining Matthew 5, which we are going to be talking a little more about. So listen to what Monte Judah says. So he's very familiar with the context and the culture. As a Jew himself, he knows a lot of things that was happening at that time. So I'm bringing him up now to, to kind of give us a view of it very interested glory to god amen he's from the lion and the lamb ministry lion and the lamb ministry glory to god praise god so all right does matthew chapter 5 verse 32 basically mean mean that it is against God's word to marry praise God All right, we keep praying. When you're going to deep waters, deep waters try to sink you, but we are good by the grace of God. All right. Started playing, so not sure where it stopped. All right, so if we hear him come back on as we wait, 
then we will go back to the clip. All says, right. Does Matthew All right. chapter 5 verse 32 basically mean that it is against God's word to marry a divorced woman regardless of why she got divorced? I have the quote right here where it says this. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Uh, this verse uh, doesn't really have enough information around it to really fully understand what he just said there. Let me give you the background. Uh, he was addressing a very common thing that was taking place in his day, part of the corruption that was in that generation. And it basically came down to this. There would be a man who would marry a young lady. Uh, they would have children. Now he gets up to about middle-aged. And all of a sudden, he gets a little frisky, and so he decides, hey, I'm going to divorce my wife. I'm going to go find this young, sweet thing, and I'm going to have more fun. Well, the whole concept is just a cover for adultery. In other words, he got divorced for adultery. And basically what the Messiah is saying is this. If you get divorced for the reason of adultery, marriage doesn't cover the adultery. It's still adultery. And that's basically what he's saying. And he commit, causes his own wife to commit adultery at the same time when he does this. And so let me just put it real simple. Here's, here's what he was really teaching. If you're a man or a woman and you decide, well, I'm going to use the mechanism of divorce so that I can go have a relationship with another person, you are committing adultery before God. You're violating that commandment. Marriage is not a cover and does not make it right uh, for what you have done. That's essentially what he was teaching them. Praise God. Amen. Thank God. Thank God for Monte Judah. So we heard that. So we can pick up now and go a little further in it. So Matthew 5 tells us plainly what is happening. So we are going to pick up pick up right here now and continue our, our discussion. So, there's something else I want to teach you about the scriptures. Alright? Every verb every verb has something called voices. Amen? Everybody who does a little English at one point they have something called voices. Active voice, passive voice, and middle voice. So watch this. This is very important that we go through it in order to explain the text. So here we go. Here we go. Voices speaks to a grammatical understanding of verbs in Greek and English or any other language voices all right so what's this now voices speaks to who perform the action of the verb and who receive the action of the verb in any sentence i hope i'm making sense for, for those who may not be so bookish but i'm going to try my best to make it simple for you so when you say what voice is it in you are trying to find out who does what and who receives what in terms of the action? So, what is now? There are three voices. There are three voices in English and in Greek. The first one is the active voice. The active voice. It means the subject performs the actions and the object. So in a sentence you have the subject, the verb, and the object. So simple put, subject, verb, object. So when it is in the active voice, the subject, the person that you're speaking about, or the thing, perform the verb and something else or someone else. For example, John divorced Mary. John is the subject of the sentence. Divorced is the verb. And Mary is the object. So, John performed the action which is divorce. Who get the divorce action? Mary. So, Mary felt 
the divorce, but it is John who did it. Not that, jo not that John is not affected by divorce in the context, but John did the divorce to Mary. So that is called the active voice. The next voice is called the middle voice or middle passive. This is where the subject performs the action on himself or on herself or itself. John divorced himself. So John is the subject. What did John do? Divorce again. But when you ask yourself, who him divorced? Himself. So the action of the verb goes right back to the subject. In this case, it's John. For example, if we say John killed himself, you call that what? Suicide. Because John killed somebody, but the person he killed was himself. So that is what you call middle voice or middle passive. Passive voice the action of the verb is performed on the subject by another person or thing. So we say, since we are dealing with marriage and divorce, I put the sentences with something about marriage. So John was divorced by Mary. So the, the, the term by introduced the passive voice. John was divorced. What? You ask. By how or him divorced? He said, by Mary. So, John and Mary married. Then he said, John divorced by Mary. So, John divorced Mary is active. John was divorced by Mary. So, John is in the passive. So, the divorce comes from Mary to John. Very important. The Greek verbs, they also have what is called active voice, middle voice, and passive voice. So, let us use this little knowledge to, to let's review there are three voices active voice active voice john divorced mary middle voice are middle passive john divorced himself and number three the passive voice john was divorced by mary take a look at it and refresh your mind on it and then we should be good to go right there, right now. All right? Glory to God. So, when we go to the scripture, which we are going to do now, I'm going to show you the verbs. And I'm going to show you what voice the verb is in. And then you're going to see how to translate the verb. And you're going to fret because... What I notice is that a lot of the translators, they almost ignore some of these voices. And then a woman is termed as committing adultery. The woman does do nothing. The man divorced the woman. And the woman has cry out her eye. The woman has balls the boy her life mash up. And you are going to say the woman commit adultery. I can't understand. So let's hear what Jesus says in context. Matthew. 532. If you look on your screen, I'm going to show it on the screen for you. It says, And I say unto you that anyone, let me put it up on the screen for you now. All right, Matthew 532 on your screen. So, those of you, you don't do Greek, you don't do any of those things, so I'm going to make it as simple as I can. What is now? Let me, for those who are new, the letters in red, the letters in red of him, let him give her a divorce. That is the that is the the the, 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 trans, the, the, the translation or the meaning of what the verb the verse or word supposed to mean. The one here so is the Greek. Below the red letter is the part of speech. Okay? Part of speech. How you pronounce the word, it's above it, up here so, R2, for example, R2 mean, mean of him. Alright, so let's go on now. It's going to make a lot of sense when I show you this, so it's very important. And he said in verse 32, everybody know ego, ego, from which we get ego, everybody know this word ego, the Greek word is ego, from which we get the I, that's where it comes from. But, but I... I say to you that 
anyone or uh, any man or uh, everyone translated here it is masculine singular what is now anyone what divorcing see it here divorcing the wife of him see there now divorcing the wife of him it is in the way called parts to perform he is divorcing his wife except uh, on the account of sexually immorality upon you or fornication what's the problem now cause it her to commit adultery here it is a man divorces his wife and cause her to commit adultery how that work how that work it's a misunderstanding of the verse let me show you why let's look at it sit to commit adultery right here so if you're looking at the screen you can see to commit adultery underneath it is a v which means it's a verb and a n p it means the p mean it is in the passive form it's in the what passive form we just got two voices a while ago when it is in the passive form what do we say again passive form means somebody did the action and you suffer for it so in this verse the husband divorced the wife and the wife is blamed for adultery that is what jesus says the man who divorces his wife and she did not commit adultery or fornication against him he caused her to be blamed or stigmatized as a what adulterer that's what the voice is said so it is in the aries a for aries and n is for infinitive and it is in the passive voice so the woman not do nothing the woman didn't go and marry again because some people say why the woman commit adultery because she go and married again there's nothing in the verse that says the woman went and marry again that's why she commit adultery don't add to the text it's not there it says because the man divorce her if him not divorce her because she commit fornication or adultery he cause her see there cause it that's another verb there so and if you look at the meaning or the part of speech of the verb it is we are called present active active voice so he transfers his adultery to the woman that's what jesus is saying when a man divorces his wife and he has no biblical reason for divorcing her he transfer his guilt of adultery which he has in his heart remember verse 28 is lost enough for the woman he might watch the woman he might pray the woman and he might touch her with the right hand now he comes to a point now that because he wants the woman the, the, the rabbi just explained a while ago because he wants to marry that woman he comes and divorces his wife in order to marry the next woman jesus is saying men who do these things and are women you are committing adultery even though you may go and get married and feel like you are right that's what jesus says right here yes questions are coming in uh questions let me check let me check the let me check the stream for any anybody else who have questions yes there's a question in the house go ahead sister ivy Uh huh. Sister Ivy is asking that there is a special woman of God which we love and dearly love, Paula White. She married. She was married to Pastor White, and both of them are pastors and preachers, and they divorce. And as far as I can remember, right now that both of them have remarried. As far as I remember. Right, I think both of them are remarried. No, she's sister Ivy is asking, are they or have they committed adultery according to this? According to Jesus, they didn't have any biblical reason to divorce, they commit adultery. That's what that's what this says. 
it's very clear because both of them have been pastors the wife can't say the husband commit adultery with another woman therefore I want a divorce she he couldn't accuse her of adultery and therefore whatever else they had to work out because remember now Jesus was talking to his disciples you know he was not talking to sinners he was not talking to Christian marrying to sinners you know and uh, that he might deal with he might deal with Christian uh, believers and believers he's saying when you see another man or another woman and you desire the woman in your heart and you start to make faults or find fault with your husband or your wife to get a divorce in order to marry the next person that you are watching you are committing adultery that's what jesus says it is plain plain as day All right, I, I'm looking, yes, I'm looking at the, 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 the question if you have any right there. So let's understand what Jesus says and, and be clear. Jesus says people may divorce and don't commit adultery. If the reason is or the exception is the person commits adultery. He's not saying if somebody commits adultery, you must divorce. That's not what Jesus says. He's not commanding divorce. But he's saying, if that's your reason for divorce, your spouse say, him say I'm a Christian and I commit adultery with you. And say I'm a Christian. I want to check it out. Him no repent. I plan to change. And you say, you know what? I don't live no more with this in my house. And you divorce him. Jesus is saying, if you do that and marry again, you won't be called an adulterer. Because the reason for divorce and remarriage is allowed according to the scripture. But John Piper and, and Gina Jennings and many more, they are saying, until the man I shot physically dead, you have no permission under God to divorce and remarry. I don't see it in the scripture. The one that we are studying before us disagrees with them. It's, it, it's, a, it's a very good thing to say that you don't believe in divorcing any, for any reason. Fine. But it is wrong to deny somebody a biblical right. If God says he will allow you, man should allow what God allow. In the sense that God says, all right, if the man commits adultery, which he should not, he breaks the vow, he breaks the bond of marriage. He, he became one flesh with a lot as somebody else. And you are hurting so much that you don't want to continue. And you divorce and remarry. Jesus says, you have not committed adultery. But those people who put eye upon other men. Or you put an eye upon other women. And come, come find fault to your spouse. Because you have another man in mind. Or another woman in mind that you think is better. Jesus is saying, you can't hide divorce and get married again if you cover up your adultery. God knows your heart. God decides that the Bible says, the Bible says, marriage is honorable. Mar marriage is honorable. So people are asking if these people who commit adultery by marrying again without biblical proof if they will go to hell the bible says marriage is honorable in all in the bed and defiled but warm but adulterers and warmongers god will judge so me leaving that side for now god will judge amen yes people can repent yes people repent and get forgiveness and so on and so forth no problem with that so let's let's flow now into some other stuff in the same verse the same verse so watch this now we are going right back to the same verse and when we go back to the same verse we are going to see something else coming right out there amen hallelujah so 
the verse where is it all right it's right there so so what is now all right let me uh, put now right here all right there there is it so let's go on now so it is clear that cause it her to commit adultery when you read it in english it gives you the wrong impression that a, a divorced wife who is innocently divorced she commits adultery because her husband divorced her nothing could be further from the truth it's a mistranslation and representation of the words of jesus that's what it is and when i look through all of the translation them i can only find one that brings out the passive voice of the verse that it should and look at the next next class and whoever if her having been divorced what is past now if her having been divorced or whoever married the woman who was divorced what is now having been divorced it's another verb again and the verb is in what the middle or the passive voice the passive voice so this woman who was divorced she was divorced for no reason of her own a man comes along likes her desire her and gets married to her what happened to that man it says here if that man shall marry the woman who is divorced commits adultery now think about it you meet a woman who was divorced for no fault of her own and in marrying her you commit adultery how that work it is because the translators don't look on the voice of the verb why it looks that way so what is now what's the voice of this word commit adultery what's you now the verb is present and it's an indicative mood and it is in the middle voice what do you say is the middle voice again remember we said the voice is what's the middle voice again middle voice or middle person what is that again it is the subject perform an action against himself so what is now when the man marries this woman who was blamed for adultery she was what blamed for adultery and she was innocent he will take the blame on himself as well he never go and commit no adultery but because he married her who was called an adulterous woman and she's innocent he he takes upon himself see that it is what i call passive so what he does affect him he never he never commit adultery against the woman and her husband but the, it come back to him so he will have to blame he will have to take what you call the stigma it is called a stigma sometimes when people do wrong it go with them for a lifetime and sometimes when you are blamed for a wrongdoing it go with you for a lifetime so here it is now the man who marries the innocently accused woman that was divorced they are going to blame him also for adultery and this is what this is saying it is not saying he actively actively commit adultery but he was is also blamed for adultery just like the woman so in the case of verse 31 and 32 who are the true culprits that's the question who is uh, who are the true culprits so when you read these verses one of the problem i have is that when i'm studying a scripture i am going to look at every word i'm going to look at every verb and look at the device the, the active middle passive and to see what it is saying when you study Matthew 5 32 it is saying a lot of things different from what the translators have translated for us and it is very sad because it is making worse what is already a bad situation so let me just go back to these powerpoints as we go forward in our presentation so Matthew 5 
the audience, Jesus to his disciples. The who in the text? The man married a single, whosoever married a single man. The woman, she may be married a single. The actions of the man, the man in question in verse 32, what is the actions? He keeps looking with lust or lustfully, his right eye offend him. He acts upon his lust, his right hand offend him. And he goes and divorces his wife when he do him nothing because he finds a better woman, prettier woman, etc. That is adultery. He, he is married, therefore he goes ahead and divorces his wife in order to marry the woman he is lusting after. That's the essence of the chapter. That's what I like how Monty Judah put it. The man is using divorce and getting married to cover his adulterous heart and adulterous act. And Jesus said, hmm, God knows your heart. It was like that. The next thing that they used to do is that when the man sent out the woman, they don't give the woman the, married, the, 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 the divorce certificate. So if you send the woman out and she's not having a divorce certificate and she go get married, what go on? She's going to look like she leave her husband, marry one other man because she's a loose woman. And the husband could come, or the farmer husband who run her out, etc. could come and say, you see it? You left me for no man here. And blame her for adultery. It was a wicked practice that the Pharisees, who were supposed to be law abiding, scripture abiding, they were doing. Who really committed adultery? In Matthew 5 20 to 32. Who really committed adultery? There are three persons there. Three. The man, the him, him wife, or the second husband. Who really committed adultery? The man who was looking. Are the woman who in divorce are the second husband that the woman married to? Who commit adultery? Let's look at it. Who suffers? So we say it already. It is the man who was lost in that commits the adultery. He commits adultery in his heart. He goes with his heart full of adultery. And he divorces his wife because of his adulterous heart. And marries another person. He is the one who commits adultery. Who suffers for or uh, get blamed for the adultery? The wife gets the blame for the adultery. Because she is sent out of the house falsely. The wife of the adulterer gets the blame. And the second husband gets the blame. So he marry her and he is innocent. She is innocent in the divorce. And he gets the blame for adultery just like the wife. This is what Jesus is correcting because Jesus knew very well, our Lord knew very well who the culprit was or who the culprit is. And he points it out. But because we don't speak Greek, we speak English. When we say adultery, amen, when we say adultery, we don't readily understand whether it is active, middle voice, or passive. So we just run with it and we convey the wrong thing to people. Who may end up in hell for the adultery? Who may end up in hell? The divorced wife who did nothing? I guess not. The man who married the divorced wife who did nothing himself? I guess not. The first husband is the one that commits adultery because he was lusting after another woman. That's the crux of the matter. He should deal with his right eye and his right hand. His lust is what led him to divorce his wife for no reason at all. And as Monty Judah said, the men marry young. When they reach middle ages, like some men in our time, they want a young girl. They don't want old foot no more. They want a young girl to prove that they are physically viable. And they divorce or lust after younger girls. A lot of men, right? I had a gentleman up my side. He, did, he was married, but the man was almost 60 at the time. He said he was about 60 years old. And he was driving a robot taxi. 
he was driving a robot taxi and he was saying boy I'm free work hard and I was inquiring why you have to work hard and he said boy find a young girl and get a young baby you know I'm here for work hard at 60 with a young baby with a young girl and he had children before but he was proving himself able to get ladies pregnant and he was at 60 years old worrying about nappy and diaper and baby feeding that's what the enemy does to us amen all right so let me go with these and then we're going to close not long after this section i'm giving you them now because i'm going to be using them going forward over and over or from time to time i'm going to be using them these terms over and over from time to time so i'm still looking at the, the list to see if there's any question that i can answer fine what is this is what the lord dropped in my spirit and when i was doing family life ministry to our teacher mrs blossom white for those of us who know mrs blossom white you will hear her sometime i don't know if she's still and an love love fm sunday morning 7 30 to 8 i think it's a i think moments of hope uh something to the effect she was the one who taught us family life and this is one of the things that came out of the studies and it was something the lord put on my spirit as well. no two born again believers can have a problem that they with God can't fix. There's no such thing as irreconcilable differences. When Christian divorce, the, peop the divorce people normally say incompatible, irreconcilable difference, or the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Some of which is not true. Not true at all. No. Notice I'm saying I'm not talking about a, a Christian with a sinner now. So don't mix me up. Don't mix me up. No two born again believers who seek to follow God and to obey God's word can have a problem that there is no such that, that they can't fix. That's one. Two. Two. The problem as I pray and the Lord begin to minister to my own spirit. The problem is this. Whenever two Christians are mashed up, are divorced, it's what, this is the problem. Or a part of the problem. One, one or both of them is not walking in the spirit. Look at it carefully. Whenever Christian split, two of them are Christian, two of them I serve God. Somebody taught, sometimes they told them I speak in tongues and I prophesy. But they mash up and divorce. One, either the husband or the wife, not walking in the spirit, or the husband and the wife, not walking in the spirit. Because you cannot be a Christian and walking in the spirit as husband and wife and going to divorce court. Is either you're walking in the spirit and doing what God says, husband love your wife wife submit to your husband or you are not walking in the spirit and the flesh takes over but you cannot be walking in obedience to the word of god and gone to divorce court as believers with with no valid cause i'm not talking about believers and sinners because when i get to believer and sinner getting married i will deal with those passages that deal with that so one of the problems I find is that a lot of the Bible teachers, they take the passages that deal with believers and sinners married together and they apply it to two believers marrying together. That's a wrong thing to do. Jesus was talking about two persons who are believers and supposed to be living for God, going and getting married to somebody else and they have been lost in their heart. It is adultery. Three, Jesus said in Matthew 19, it is unforgiveness or hardness of heart or bitterness lies at the root. So somebody now forgive. Somebody find it hard to forgive. It is for the hardness of your heart why Moses permit you. 
to put away your wife. So when we read Matthew 19, which is where we're going next, we're going to examine what is happening there. Next one. One or both parties is looking elsewhere at another option. Yes. One or both parties is looking elsewhere as another option. In other words, I find sometimes when you're talking to a husband and a wife who have a, pro who have a problem and they might take more divorce, a lot of times the wife find another man We have put argument to her and that man look more interested than more interested, more kind, more loving, he's sweeter than my husband. My God, you know, he's such a nice man. He's treating me so nice. That's what I find. I'm telling you, other pastor, I tell you, sometimes is what happens. So, and sometimes the man has eyes on a woman that he would love to marry if he's getting divorced. So he will not deal with his marital problems. He will not forgive. He will not go and conform to the scriptures because he have an eye elsewhere. A matter of fact, I've met a few. I've met some ladies too. And them counsel. And them ask, you know, why I want to come to God and come to church? And I will ask, but you have a man in your life? Yes. Are you planning to get married? No. Why? But I'm married, you know, and he's not divorced yet. He married and not divorced yet, but he promised me, say, I'm going to divorce her and marry me. <laughs> I'm laughing at a serious matter. He promised him to divorce him legitimate wife. If he marry me. And the woman is patiently waiting on the man to divorce his legitimate wife in order to marry her. She should have learned that if she was in the position of that wife, she can be the next victim of such an adulterous man. That man is an adulterer. And she's willing, saying she can serve God by waiting on that man to a divorce his wife in order to marry her. That's wickedness. It is wickedness. I say to Christian men and women who are going through problems, until you solve your problem with your husband and wife, and if you can and if you think you can sort it out and you have a divorce, may not tell you say you have a divorce, but if you're goddess, so, take the man or the woman that you have in mind out of your mind. And think clearly about your husband and your wife and solving a problem. And stop trying to get divorced because you have a woman waiting to be married to you. You have a woman, the pan it, pan it, pan it, they say, boy, the back burner, I wait. That is adultery. Jesus says, if you, ma if you divorce your wife in order to get married to somebody you have been lusting after, you commit adultery, even though you got to marry that person. And you shall pay for that adultery my god very interesting amen all right so let me run a few more things by us and then we can we can close for tonight and then we're going to pick up match 19 in our next session amen back to the slides going to run a few more points there so spiros i told you about this book i think i might need to write the title and everything underneath it so let me just see if I can bring it up for you. Amen. I put it right here. I, I, I think I show you already. This book, amen, is one of those books. What about divorce? This gentleman here, he examined the passages from the Greek, line by line, word by word, as I tried to show you a while ago. He did it. It is the first scholar that I found a book that seek to explain and, and, and exegete the text in such detailed fashion. And for that, I give God thanks. He continues. So it is from this book that he summarizes Matthew 5 from 20 to 32. So I'm going to share those with you and then we wrap up. One cannot divorce his wife or husband for any other reason than fornication. And this is and this only if he chooses to do so. It is not a command that she must be divorced. In other words, 
if the man find out say the woman commit fornication or adultery he may divorce her for it but he is not commanded to him can forgive her him can counsel her get it so there is no command to divorce number two if he or she does dismiss a spouse for a reason other than fornication there must be a divorce issued which enables the innocent party to remarry in an honorable way that's what jesus was saying you can't divorce the woman and give her the document and make her become or uh, looked upon or uh, looked down on like she has committed adultery it is not right three one can legitimately dismiss one's spouse for engaging in sexual sin so if the man commits adultery or the woman and you decide say, since he now has stopped in the plan to repent you now will live with him you are allowed to divorce him the bible never command you to divorce him you can still put up with him and stay with him fine but if somebody else me can't take up with me can't take it they have a biblical permission to go ahead number four in looking at a woman or uh, caressing her with sexual desire or uh, looking at a woman lustfully adultery has already been committed against her against the woman that you are lusting after and of course against your wife and at the same time see there against the perpetrator's own wife so you're sin against the woman that you are lost after and you're sin against the your wife because you're a married man you're a married man all right number five in marrying an innocent dismissed wife innocent dismissed wife one must be ready to carry for life the unjustified false stigma of adultery she has already suffered she has already been suffering when her first husband dismissed her unjustly she however does not in herself commit an act of adultery by remarrying her first husband brought upon her the stigma of being considered an adulteress although she was not that's why jesus said caused it her and the king james said to commit adultery it really means it caused her to be treated as an adulterer but in fact she's in it is in the passive voice she suffers the penalty of adultery and she did not commit any crime all right so we pause right there and the homework is for you to look up Matthew 19 for me Matthew 19 1 to 12 and you're supposed to look also on Mark 10 let me see if I can find it for you I'm going to scroll down and find it for you Mark 10 Mark 10 1 to 12 as well Mark 10 1 to 12 especially verse verses 10 to 12 we are going to deal with those next time and if you notice i am dealing with the divorce passages one by one i'm not running to mark i'm not running to luke i'm not running all over the place because one of the things that i find fine for fine happening is that people don't spend time to explain the scripture before them they go ahead and just quote and don't investigate the context it's not right to do that so matthew 19 1 to 12 mark 10 1 to 12 we are going to go to them but we are going to go to match first and if we get the time we go to the book of mark amen let me take another look also at the the question the chat and if there's any question there we can take the question before we go ahead so thank you my dear sisters and brothers a lot of things are happening in churches today and remember now jesus dealing with divorce and remarriage he was not addressing a believer and an unbeliever 
he was not addressing adultery with a sinner. Paul is the one who addressed Christians and sinners getting married or Christians getting married and you mean I live with somebody, you are living with somebody, you get saved and you marry the person. Paul dealt with all of those questions. Sometimes you get married, two of you get married as, as, as sinners, all right? Two persons get married as sinners. And when they get married as sinners, they one gets saved or both get saved. Remember now, a Christian married to a sinner is called unequal yoke. Two sinners married together, one gets saved, it becomes an equal yoke. If you're a Christian and you're not married, and you want a husband or a wife, the Bible says you must not take up a sinner and get married. That is called an equal yoke. Jesus, in his preaching and teaching, he was not addressing Christians, quote-unquote, and sinners. Paul the Apostle is the one who addressed Christians and sinners. And I find a lot of our preachers and teachers, we, we, we confuse the context, we confuse the, the command, and we paint everybody with a broad brush and tell people, if you're married and divorced, or you, or you get divorced, and the man who divorced you or the woman who divorced you, don't physically dead and married again, you commit adultery. Even though Jesus never said that. Paul did not say that. However, there are some people, if they divorce and remarry, yes, they commit adultery. Those are the ones we are trying to explain for people to understand. All right, we're closing and close the session for tonight. And I say this as we close. No relationship is worth keeping at the expense of your salvation. Let me say it another way. No relationship is worth keeping at the expense of losing your faith in God. A lot of women stay with men who are abusing them, stop them from going to church, fight them and be all kind of something to them. And they lose their faith in God because they are told, don't leave the man. If you're not even going to divorce him, for your faith's sake. Some of these ladies, them, them, them lose their mind. They go crazy because they are suffering under some of these terrible men. And their pastors tell them, them can't leave. I am not the pastor to tell you that. Because when I hear of two of our church sisters, the husband was beating her really badly. And the pastor said, pray for him and stay. And a few days after that, the man chop off her head. Chop off her head. One of church of God. Chop off her head. The same church, the same community, the same thing happened again. So, at two cases. So, I am saying, even if you're not going to formally divorce, when abuse comes into the situation, when, when I read Corinthians, I will talk to you about abuse. Because if a man says I'm a Christian and I beat the woman and I'm abused, he's not Christian. He's not saved. He's only Christian by name. And if the, and if the woman says she's a Christian and I abuse the man and I beat him and I mistreat him, she's only Christian by name. So when you get to Christians and sinners who are married and the problem that they are having, divorce, yes or no, when we get there, we are going to deal with it. Because a lot of times people miscounsel, misinterpret, misapply the scriptures. As pastors, this is sensitive. It is very sensitive, heart-rending to watch and hear some things that women go through in particular at the hands of men. Some men are terrible. Yes, some women are also terrible. I can tell you a lot of stories that we find. But we are trying to understand what God wants of us in these last days. So, brethren, we said Matthew 19, 1 to 12, 
and Mark chapter 10 from verse 1 to 12. Read those two. Meditate on them. Remember now, in that verse, the Pharisees came to Jesus and them tempt him and them ask certain questions. Look at it carefully and look at his answers to them in those passages and we can take it up next time. Let us pray, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, that we could look at the scriptures again. May every member, every friend who join us, Almighty God, in this study. Lord, I pray that we will reread the scriptures. And I pray as pastors, we will begin to study again, examine the scripture again, that we can properly teach it to your people. Father, we don't know everything, so we ask for your guidance. Let your Holy Spirit open up our eyes. Teach us, O oh God, to love our wives, love our husbands, love our families, and to live without adulterous thoughts and practice and action in our life. Cover now, we pray, in the mighty, precious name of Jesus Christ. We ask you once more, amen, that if you have not yet subscribed to the channel, amen, to do so, glory to God, join us next time. We should be, we should be coming to you, hopefully, Sunday night coming. I said hopefully because the, the curfew time, the curfew time, amen, the curfew time has changed to 9 p.m. And what that will mean is that we are able to have church early, amen, back to the FTH, etc., early, and then leave and reach home at time. So once curfew is still at 9, we should be able to have Sunday evening service early enough, and then we can go home from that. So I said, hopefully, next Sunday night. So if the, the time is still 9, we are going to be having FTH, and therefore, you will join me again next Wednesday night, God's willing, for Bible study. So whether or not we might not have it at church, or we might have it at church, you will know, and if, we, and if, we, and if we're going to come to you at an earlier time, other than 8 o'clock, you will also know what time it will be. So until then, enough love, and those of us who are having challenges in our marriage, let's keep our marriages in prayer, keep our families in prayer, and if you're married to an unsaved man, keep him in prayer, and if, you're, and if your wife is unsaved, keep her in prayer, because God is still interested in your marriage to save the unsaved person and bring him or her to a life-saving relationship with God. God bless you. Pastor Ivy here tuning out until hopefully Sunday night. And if not Sunday night, we said next Sunday night, whichever it's going to be, you will be notified as to which is which. God bless you. God keep you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So join us next time. Remember to subscribe. Amen. To our channel. Hallelujah. And we say thank you very much for joining us. Pastor Javier and Mineralites New Testament Church of God. Members and friends. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful night. God bless you. Until we meet again. Blessings.